Hello and welcome to Electro Nerds Academy. Today, we're diving into the intricate world of serial communications. To understand how serial communication works, let's consider an example. Imagine we want to send a letter A from our computer to Arduino. First, this letter will be translated into binary digits since computers solely understand binary data. We can see that the converted binary number has eight binary digits or bits. Now we have to somehow transmit these eight bits to our Arduino. One way of doing this is to use eight wires, one wire to carry one bit. A high signal represents a one, and a low signal represents a zero, and all the bits will be transmitted to our Arduino simultaneously at the same time. This method of communication between the PC and the Arduino is known as parallel communication. The downside of this approach is that we have to use eight wires to send an eight-bit data. So if we want to transmit 16-bit data to our Arduino, we will have to use 16 wires. And if we want to transmit 32-bit data, we will have to use 32 wires, and so on. Another method of transmitting data from our PC to Arduino is called serial communication. In this method, instead of transmitting all bits simultaneously, they're arranged in series and conveyed one by one through a single cable. This approach reduces the number of required connections, but it is slower than parallel communication. To understand why serial communication is slower, we will have to introduce the concept of clock signal in digital electronics. A clock signal is basically a timing signal that is shared between both the sender and the receiver. This signal oscillates between high and low states at a consistent frequency. This signal maintains synchronization between the sender and the receiver. The sender will send data at each rising edge of the clock signal. Meanwhile, the receiver will read that data from the data line at each falling edge of the signal. So in parallel communication, when the first rising edge of the clock signal occurs, the sender transmits all eight data bits simultaneously on their respective data lines, which remains unchanged until the next rising edge occurs. Consequently, when the first falling edge of the clock signal occurs, the receiver reads or samples the data on all eight wires with just one clock pulse. Whereas in serial communication, the sender sends a single bit of data at each rising edge of the clock signal, which is then read at each subsequent falling edge by the receiver. As this process repeats for eight bits, serial communication ends up being eight times slower than parallel communication in this scenario. So, although serial communication is slower than parallel communication, it is still more efficient than parallel communication due to its lower cost, fewer wires, reduced interference, and ability to transmit data over long distances. In general, serial communication can be divided into two main categories, synchronous and asynchronous serial communication. In synchronous serial communication protocols, such as I2C and SPI, the clock signal plays a vital role in synchronizing transmission between the sender and the receiver. Whereas in asynchronous serial communication protocols, like UART, which is also the focus of this video, there is no role of the clock signal. We will discuss synchronous protocol in detail in a future video, but in this lesson, let's focus on the asynchronous protocol called UART. UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receive and Transmit Protocol. It is a hardware protocol that facilitates serial communication between two devices without the need for a shared clock signal. When both sender and receiver agree to use the UART protocol for communication, then the data is transmitted in the form of structured data packets. A typical UART data packet looks like this. Let's explain each section of the data packet. We will start with the start bit. Normally, when the transmitter has no data to transmit, it outputs a high signal. But when it's ready to send data, it outputs a low signal pulse, which is our start bit, signaling the beginning of data transmission. It's like alerting the receiver saying, get ready, I am sending some data. The start bit is followed by the data bits, which are the actual data bits that we want to send. So imagine if we want to send a letter A, then this letter will be converted to binary and its binary equivalent becomes the data bits for this particular data packet. The data can be 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9 bits long, but 8-bit data is the most common. Usually, both the sender and the receiver agree upon the length of the data bits in advance. After the data bits, we can optionally include a parity bit. Its role is to inform the receiver whether the data packet is corrupted or not. 
Here's how it operates. Both the receiver and transmitter must decide in advance on the type of parity they'll use, either even or odd. Let's consider using even parity, which means that the total number of ones in the complete data packet should be even. So, if the total number of ones in the data packet are even like in this case, then the parity bit will be zero. Now, if during transmission, the message becomes corrupted and one bit's value changes from zero to one, then the receiver will detect an odd number of ones in the data packet. Since they both agreed upon using even parity, the receiver concludes that the message is likely corrupted. But what if the total number of ones in the data packet are odd, like in this case? Then the parity bit is set to one to ensure that the total number of ones are even. However, it's essential to acknowledge that this error detection method has its own limitations. For instance, the parity bit itself can be corrupted or more than one bit gets corrupted. In both cases, the receiver will be unable to determine that the data packet is corrupted. After the parity bit, the next bit is the stop bit, indicated by a high signal denoting the completion of the message and the end of the data packet. Therefore, the complete data packet looks something like this. Another crucial part of every asynchronous protocol is the transmission speed. That is the speed at which the data packet will be transmitted. The transmission speed is measured in bits per second. A common speed is 9,600 bits per second, signifying that 9,600 bits are sent in a single second. This translates that each bit has a duration or width of 1 divided by 9,600, which equals approximately 104 microseconds. To avoid errors in communication, both the sender and receiver must agree on the same transmission speed beforehand. Now let's consider what happens when we transmit this same data packet at a speed of 9,600 bits per second, meaning that the width of each bit will be 104 microseconds. Communication begins when the transmitter sends a start bit, signaling the beginning of the data packet. Once the Arduino detects the start bit, it begins counting time. After 104 microseconds, it reaches the first data bit's position. However, instead of reading it immediately, since the signal might still be stabilizing, it waits an additional 52 microseconds to reach the middle of the bit duration before capturing its value. It again counts 104 microseconds to reach the middle of the second bit, reads the second bit, and repeats the process for subsequent bits, ensuring accurate data reception. As data bits stream in from the computer, a specialized hardware component inside the ATmega328 microcontroller assembles every eight bits into a byte and stores them in the serial receive buffer, a temporary memory area that can hold up to 64 bytes. From this buffer, we can read the data one byte at a time. The hardware responsible for assembling incoming bits into bytes is called the USART, Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receiver and Transmitter. This module handles the UART communication on the ATmega328 chip. It uses the TX and RX pins of the ATmega chip to transmit and receive data serially, which correspond to pins 1 and 0 on the Arduino Uno board. So basically our computer is connected to the USB jack of the Arduino Uno, which is linked to another microcontroller, 8mega16U, which in this case acts as a USB to serial converter. It takes the incoming USB data, converts it to serial data, and transmits it via the RX pin to the ATmega328. The same path can be followed when the Arduino sends data to the PC, that is, the data will be transmitted via the TX pin of the Atmega chip to the ATmega 16 u microcontroller, which in this case acts as a serial-to-USB converter and converts our serial data into USB format and sends it to the PC via the same USB jack. If we want, we can also connect other serial devices, such as another Arduino, to these pins to receive and transmit data serially. For this, connect the TX pin of the first board to the RX pin of the second board, and RX pin of the first board to the TX pin of the second board. But as mentioned earlier, that the TX and RX pins are used when the Arduino is being programmed. So to avoid any errors, don't connect anything to these pins when the Arduino is being programmed. That's all for this video. For more such content, visit our channel and check out our website for in-depth tutorials and code. The link is in the description. Finally, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you in the next one.